So good morning and warm welcome to online anesthesia postgraduate teaching program on Zoom platform sponsored by Akrila and hosted by Evan Logics and aired by Anesthesia TV. I wish you Merry Christmas on this great occasion. Today is the great day as we are completing 100 hours of teaching for postgraduates on Zoom platform. Actually, we have started this program in the 2nd January 2022, keeping in mind that the postgraduates should not be denied of theory classes for the sakes of pandemic situation. We have formed a good team with high intellectual teachers of six members and drafted the topics meticulously from the textbooks like Miller. We are immensely thankful to the faculties without which the program will not be a successful one. Without much, uh, wasting much time, since my whole family is waiting for me to celebrate the Christmas, I wish to invite the legends of our faculty to facilitate, felicitate this program. First, I call upon Tamil Nadu ISA President Amudarani Madam to facilitate this function. Over to Amudarani Madam. Assistant National Office Bearers, State Office Bearers, Past and President Executive Members, esteemed and allied uh, faculties of uh, this program, uh, dear students, very good morning to one and all. I wish you all a Merry Christmas. What a day today. It's celebrating Christmas with uh, Dr. Edward sir and uh, all over, the people from all over India. It's I am much delighted. Thank you so much, sir, for this opportunity. On behalf of uh, Tamil Nadu ISA, uh, we express our sincere appreciation and uh, congratulate Dr. Edward sir uh, for successfully completing his 100 uh, hours of online program which is a, it is a Herculean task. It's a commendable job, sir. Um, I, I think uh, it's immense pleasure to be part of this program. Thank you so much. Uh, every one of us here. Uh, sincerity and uh, uh, I mean, sharing his uh, evidence-based knowledge that with the constant efforts to each and every corner of uh, this uh, country is uh, much appreciated. Uh, I wish for the next years to come. Um, I mean, give you a wish, everyone, wish everyone uh, a happy new year. And thank you so much. Long live ISA. Thank you, thank you so much for your kind words, madam. I actually I, I wish to congratulate the team, team of the team also, sir. Definitely, madam. Thank you so much, madam. Now I call upon uh, IG editor, Dr. Rajesh Jhar, to say a few words about this program, sir. Thank you so much and uh, good morning to all of you and a very happy Merry Christmas. Uh, I think this is a... I think this is a wonderful day on uh, this Merry Christmas and this online postgraduate teaching program uh, by Dr. Edward Johnson is uh, taking an success story of uh, 100 sessions by all the joints, uh, great academicians who has uh, taken it to such a great height. It is really very heartening and happy to see that our postgraduate students are getting benefited from this online program. And probably uh, there may be many negative things about COVID, but there are certain positive part of it that uh, we have moved out from our um, classroom teaching to a, uh, another platform, online teaching program, which uh, makes the great teachers like even today, uh, we have a wonderful uh, academician and a great teacher, a great human being, uh, Dr. Pandya. Uh, similarly, the other teachers who have been taking these classes, otherwise, uh, I think many folks get used to meeting them and taking their sessions. But uh, such type of online sessions has always helped uh, our postgraduate students to learn from uh, these experts, these joints of uh, uh, anesthesia fraternity, and they have been helping a lot. I'm sure uh, this teaching program will reach more greater heights, and uh, uh, not only from India, but across the globe, people will get benefit uh, by learning uh, the various aspects of the anesthesiology. So thank you so much and my best wishes and again, heartiest congratulations for 
uh, future success of uh, this online postgraduate teaching uh, anesthesia program and benefit to all the postgraduates. Thank you once again and best wishes. Thank you, Rakesh, sir, for your wonderful words. We feel very encouraged to hear these words from you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Thank you, uh, Rakesh, sir. Now I call upon our senior member, that is Dr. Ravindra, sir, to felicitate this program, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is actually this platform and the efforts of untiring Dr. Edward Johnson is one of the real commendable work which he is doing. It's, you know, it, it needs a lot of endurance to go on for so many days and so many, you know, so many years continuously in the teaching program. In fact, this is one program which is meant for postgraduates and probably it is helping the postgraduate teachers more than the postgraduates themselves. Such a wonderful program it is. And I That's nicely, I bow down to Dr. Edward Johnson's efforts and the entire team of online anesthesia, uh, anesthesia uh, work that is going on. His uh, um, WhatsApp groups, his Facebook groups, his uh, uh, everything is commendable. His quiz, which he is conducting for so many years, continuously, every Sunday, without a break, and it is fantastic. We will all be waiting for it. Un unfortunately, every week we cannot participate, but it is a wonderful thing. I appreciate you, Dr. Edward Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the kind words, sir. Now you are calling Dr. Gurudev, sir, to say a few words. Yeah, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Johnson and team and his team for this wonderful work uh, they are doing for uh, the past so many days, you know, maybe years also. And uh, the congratulations again for scoring a century of uh, this class. I know how uh, important uh, these uh, classes are uh, there for uh, the postgraduates because um, I used to conduct classes also. I know how hungry the students will be to you know listen to the classes and then to gain knowledge. And this work of uh, Dr. Johnson and his team uh, has made uh, their life very easy all over the world probably. So I hope uh, uh, the team is going to score uh, a double century also. I wish them all success for future uh, you know uh, this uh, teaching program. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thanks. Thank you, sir. You are always my inspiration for your postgraduate teachings. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words, sir. I, I call upon uh, Rajesh, Joseph Rajesh, sir, to say a few words about this. Good morning very much. Good morning to everyone. And uh, really, thank you very much, sir. It's a wonderful day for all of us. As uh, this online anesthesia program is reaching its 100th day. Uh, nowadays, we don't hear uh, cinemas uh, celebrating their 100th days. Uh, so it is really a wonderful and it's a commendable job, sir, actually. Because starting from the day one, continuing it for 100 days without any break, it is really a big task. And uh, definitely our uh, Edward Johnson, sir, and uh, his team, my friends, Dr. Shepra, sir, Dr. Rajesh, and uh, Gomati, madam, and all, they've done uh, the wonderful job, wonderfully handled and organized the program exactly in a way how a PG expects. And as uh, uh, Dr. Ravindra sir has said, uh, apart from the PGs, it, it helped us also, actually. Uh, the way sir has conducted the program, it shows his uh, determination. It's really a big salute for you and uh, to your team, sir. And not to forget, I am uh, I consider this is a privilege and I am honored. Thank you to be, uh, thank you for considering me as a part of the team, sir. Wonderful job it does. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shilpa, please make uh, Dr. Assam as co-host, Dr. Assam. Before that, uh, I may uh, request Anji Gupta, madam, to say a few words about this program. 
हाँ जी हाँ जी मैडम यस एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन विशिंग एवरीवन अ मेरी क्रिसमस एंड अ हैप्पी न्यू ईयर and uh, i first of all want to congratulate um, uh, edward johnson sir for conducting such wonderful course uh, which has been benefiting the post graduate students everywhere uh, i must uh, say that the post graduates today are so fortunate that they have uh, access to such kind of uh, excellent uh, teaching programs uh, because uh, not every uh, post graduate student is fortunate enough to have uh, teachers like uh, johnson sir and uh, bala venkat sir and uh, gurudat sir so it is a uh, definitely a boon to the post graduate student to have online access to the online programs and i have attended many of his uh, uh, lectures and i was uh, privileged to be given an opportunity to uh, te- to speak on the platform uh, this elite platform and i i am um, so impressed with the quality of the program which has been maintained by johnson sir he ensures that every lecture will be up to the mark it is not that you just go and speak anything and uh, everything is covered on the topic so i uh, uh, my heartiest congratulations and best wishes uh, for the su- uh, further success of this program and uh, thank you sir thank you so much madam thank you thank you so much for madam for your kind words now may i may request dr assam sir to say few words about this program uh, <clears throat> thank you edward johnson sir good morning everyone and uh, it's an honor to be here uh, amongst uh, legends in anesthesia and who's who in anesthesia actually and before i start uh, merry christmas to everyone and i wish you all a happy new year i think uh, johnson sir much, much has been already said but however what i see uh, is you know putting hours of teaching like what you gurudad uh balamiket sir does is something i mean many of you the way you take this uh, uh teaching program to a different level which we require and the post graduates require is something uh, commendable and amazing and this is not easy i am sure uh, family must be suffering your uh, family time and uh, things not only that apart from that on uh, whatsapp having uh, uh, you know monthly i mean weekly quizzes Uh, quiz sessions uh, weekly teaching programs on whatsapp that requires a lot of dedication because uh, you know you need to have a sequence of events that goes in or the quiz that goes in it's not that easy and you have hand picked uh, uh, you know uh, speakers to speak about and thank you for uh, uh, you know letting me the part of your uh, program thank you so much sir we always look up to you and um, all the best for your uh, sessions and most importantly uh, the post graduates uh, it will be unfortunate if they don't uh, you know go through the talks that you have already because doing this on on every sunday without fail is something commendable thank you so much and uh, all the best for your future uh, endeavors sir thank you so much thank you so much sir you are also your best uh, post graduate teaching sir teacher sir i used to refer your notes before taking it, my classes for the post graduates wonderful thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much thank you sir now i call upon uh, most respectful uh, honor uh, faculty leaders is balavan sir is also there sir welcome sir yeah sir uh, good morning uh, am i audible dr edward yes sir you are audible sir uh, good morning wishing you a merry christmas and uh, it's such a nice coincidence that um, this very important uh, day for celebration uh, apart from the merriest part the christmas we also have another merrier part of celebrating the century of um, online anesthesia thank you dr edward johnson and the associate editors dr gomathi dr rajesh dr shantini dr siva prasad dr guru sandhya dr Sa- dr <laughs> sarva vinodini and the tech team of a1 logistic dr sindil and dr selva kumar always uh, when uh, accomplishments happen it's because of 
the thought process of a leader, but consistency is maintained because of every person in the team. So at this important and crucial juncture, I would uh, want to thank each one of you for having been a part of the process in creating an academic fervor for all those postgraduates who want to quench their thirst, want to learn more. And uh, it is also very nice that uh, teaching happens across. But there are few people who focus on certain specific work, like Dr. G. L. Ravindra in obstetrics, Dr. Sunil Pandya said in high-risk obstetrics. And uh, so what happens is, uh, apart from the textbook, the knowledge that they gain out of doing very focused clinical work, the clinical pearls that emanate from their experience, when it is shared to the postgraduates, it means a lot. It's just not the theory. It's not just not passing the exam, but passing the true exam of life of making sure that the morbidity and the mortality of the patient uh, is made sure that you minimize it to the best extent possible because of knowledge. Knowledge is power. And I consider that uh, this platform gives enough power to the fraternity. And uh, I also respect all the senior people who spoke before me who do phenomenal work in education. Dr. Gurudat, sir, all my DNB pros graduates, uh, they will ask, ask me permission to go and listen to Dr. Gurudat. And uh, sir, I think uh, you have been a, you've been a, a absolute uh, idol and hero in front of our postgraduate students uh, who learned a lot from you and uh, they really revere you for that. And uh, Dr. Azam, uh, who has made a lot of inroads into educating uh, the young minds. And uh, I also see Dr. Anju Gupta, Dr. Joseph Rajesh, all of them who really Thanks. want to contribute uh, enormously to enriching uh, our young minds. If all of us together work like this in Sinkarni. Soon the world will look at us as a very reputed and respected uh, anesthesia fraternity. And it's very important that uh, we need to have a level playing ground. That's what uh, it's meant in, uh, uh, in all international uh, sports. You need a level playing ground, which means um, Every person who has registered as an anesthesia postgraduate in this country should have an access to quality education. Some may be uh, gifted to have great teachers and some may not, but to bridge the gap and to make sure that uh, there is a level playing ground for every postgraduate. This platform, I think, uh, gives enough sucker to them. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Edward Johnson and the team will keep going strength to strength, keep creating excellent sessions. And uh, at the end of it, all that we need is every single, it's the quality control. Every single person who finishes his or her education in the fraternity of anesthesia is updated with enough knowledge, which makes sure that uh, what the mind knows the eye sees. So to make the mind know the most of the things that the eye, eyes needs to see, we need platform like this. And heartiest congratulations and uh, been very happy to be have been part of one of those sessions. And we continuously would like to be a part of your sessions. And we pray almighty on this uh, auspicious day to give you the energy, the vibrancy and the power to choose the right topic, right speakers, and uh, continue your journey. And we are all with you, sir. And my sincere thanks for the opportunity. And uh, uh, these are endeavors which have to be appreciated in abundance by all concerned. Thanks for the opportunity, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And I, I, I call upon Dr. Sunil Pandya, sir, to say a few words. At the outset, I would like to congratulate Dr. Edward and team for doing a phenomenal job he has to sustain for 100 hours uh, of endurance, hard work, and a lot of meticulous planning. Importantly, 
liaising and coordinating with all the faculty the topics the selection of topics the the rhythm in which uh, the things flows from head to, uh, head to toe and the sub specialties i yeah. think uh, i think you have done and your you and your team have done a phenomenal mm. job and as all the uh, stalwarts in anesthesia who have been uh, spoken before me uh, i have rightly uh, given their uh, tribute and i think it's you really really deserve a good round of applause to edward and his team uh, for doing this uh, uh, successful teaching the post graduate cs uh, i follow each one of you uh, um, and i have seen that the notes of dr azam or uh, kanya kumari's uh, powerpoints and if you just google search any topic you get on isa website to kanya kumari website and azam's note they just spring in front of you so i think uh, you have done phenomenal job each one of you rather so even joseph or anju and everybody i would say so let's let us keep doing this good work and see that uh, as dr bala said his vision uh, let india be the global hub for education in anesthesia and take anesthesia to the different level which we have not seen uh, congratulations again to edward and team thank you thank you sir we are eagerly waiting for you in lecture hall sir yes now uh, i call upon uh, pravin kumar pravin kumar say, to, say a few words dr pravin kumar Hi sir. Uh, good morning to all my seniors and teachers. And uh, thank you, Edward sir, for providing me an opportunity to present a certain topic in this uh, online anesthesia PG program. Uh, I would say uh, practice makes a man perfect. And being an anesthesiologist, uh, uh, reading from a head to foot, everybody will not get a chance to operate on all kind of specialties. At the same time, uh, we might be. Uh, uh, um prone to do such cases rarely in our lifetime so uh, it, it becomes a duty to at least see and uh, talk with the expert who does the cases which has been done very rarely uh, so this platform gives an opportunity for all the pgs and to teachers like me who does a certain rare cases to present on this uh, forum and to uh, get a discussion with the um, pgs it really helps us uh so i thank edward sir uh, in uh, providing me such an opportunity to share my content in this uh, forum thank you thank you sir thank you pravin thank you uh, viewers you, are, you are also can post your feedback in the chat box now i am going to present a, a presentation regarding how we reached this success of 100 hours and also a few feedbacks from our faculty and post graduates so we have started this uh, successful program in the 2nd january of this year 2022 and we have traveled one year well, it is a long journey with a lot of faculties 86 faculties have uh, attended this program through the year and the viewers it is around 50k that is 50000 viewers uh, our program was telecasted in seven channels this statistics is taken from only two youtube channels that is 50000 is from two youtube channels and it's also telecast through the zoom platform that the statistics is not uh, taken in the count as 50k so it was streamed in seven places that is anesthesia tv youtube channel anesthesia tv facebook channel and anesthesia cases anesthesia tv facebook and anesthesia tv web portal and pain tv facebook channel online anesthesia pg teaching youtube channel and our own online anesthesia facebook channel so how the success was possible it is only because of this our grand social network we have online anesthesia youtube channel with 8000 uh, subscribers and also our online anesthesia facebook with 3000 followers and online anesthesia whatsapp group in whatsapp group uh, i have 10 whatsapp groups totally 3300 Post graduate sir in the WhatsApp group, and also we have a Telegram group. And apart from that, we have tied a partnership with Anesthesia TV. They are telecasting our program live in five channels. Thank you, Anesthesia TV. And uh, we can see the few consultant feedback who are not able to attend today meeting. So this is from uh, Christine Christine Bittan. He is from USA. He has presented one topic on pediatric airway. He has written two books on the pediatric airway. 
We will listen to your message. Dr. Christine Witten, an anesthesiologist from the United States who is honored to have been asked to participate in the online anesthesia program this year. As online anesthesia completes 50 classes and over 100 hours of teaching, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Edward Johnson and his incredible group of instructors for producing such a valuable educational resource. The amount of work required to create a training program like this is daunting, and they deserve a great deal of credit and thanks. Good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you, Adam. Now, it is a message from Sunanda Gupta, his Emirates professor from Ludhiana. It has been a pleasure to be associated with uh, Dr. Edward Johnson and his team uh, who have started this innovative teaching program in, um, for the postgraduates and the practitioners all over the country. And after marathon sessions, they have reached the first anniversary. And I find it has been a raging hit with all the postgraduates and the anesthesia practitioners in Udaipur and Rajasthan. I wish you a very happy association with all the stalwarts of our anesthesia fraternity and all the postgraduates and the anesthesia practitioners are definitely going to uh, be very happy and benefit from these sessions which you have organized. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Now, this message is from uh, our most respected teacher, that is Pankaj Kundra, sir. He is actually a mentor for me. He is an academic dean of Jimmer Pandicherry. Dear Professor Edward, you are doing an extraordinary job in teaching the students in most innovative way. MCQ's expertise is an extreme difficult skill to acquire, and you have mastered it. Keep it up, and all the best. Regards and best wishes always. Thank you, sir. Now, this message is from Dr. Parthas Saradi, a professor of Mahatma Gandhi Medical College, Pondicherry. The thirst never decreasing, the energy which is always increasing, the commitment which is far above the imagination to make all speakers tune to his expectation and needs of the project postgraduates. Attending other webinars to speak and chat in between, attending other conferences, adjusting for Sunday ISA meets, Professor Offline Teaching, Head and other non-medical issues in the college, he is mentioning about me. Some private cases in the evenings, examiner, IG, editorial board members, continuous reading by himself to update. Above all, the speed at which he responds to an academic question, his passion for the speciality. Such an unique person is Dr. Edward Johnson, my colleague, mate, and uh, senior in undergraduate Javur, all the best and continue your, your good work. Thank you, Pata, for your kind words. And Azam has already talked about my our uh, program. This is from Anji Grewal, a supervisor and head of uh, the College of Hospital, Ludhiana. I have worked with uh, Anji Grewal in writing uh, IG editorial for few editorials. Well, congratulations to Online Anesthesia and its Chief Editor, Dr. J. Edward Johnson and his dynamic team. It is an excellent forum to learn and understand anesthesia and its intricacies. The quality of the talk is excellent. The speakers chosen carefully who enrich us all with their cumulative years of experience in anesthesia energy. Kudos to the team and exhorting the PG students to stay tuned to Online Anesthesia for high quality content and enriching experience to make anesthesia safe for our patients. Warm regards. Thank you, Anji Madam. This is from Professor Elsa Vargis. He is a former professor and HOD of KMC Manipal. You have done an amazing job, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for including me also in your programs. Thank you, Madam. And this is from Nares Paliwal. He is Associate Professor of Anesthesia, DRPD MMC Amravati. He is a regular attendee of our all program. He, he congratulated the team for online analysis speciality, Dr. Edward Johnson, for taking so much efforts in completion of their uninterrupted online 50 classes. It is proving immensely valuable for the postgraduates and providing them 
an easy platform to learn various aspects of anesthesiology. I wish them all the best for the future. Thank you, sir. This is from Kala Madam. He is a retired anesthesia director of MMC Chennai. Dear Professor EJ, every day before retiring to bed, I used to read anesthesia news, academic messages that helps me to refresh my knowledge as well as helps me to a lot in the operating room for teaching. Especially your tip for the day, quizzes, etc. May God bless you and your services. Thank you, madam. This is from Kannan Bodhiraj. He is a professor and HODM, Thaini Medical College. Merry Christmas to Dr. Edward, sir and team. Congratulations to online anesthesia team and grand success of the program. It is practically and academically very successful program for the consultants and the postgraduates for updating knowledge in the field of anesthesia and critical care. Best quality lectures series are delivered. I humbly request Dr. Edward sir and team to continue this CME program forever. Thank you, Kannan. He is my close friend. And this is from Nagalichmi, Professor and Department of Anesthesiology. Sri Vengrais from Degree College and Research Centre, Pondicherry. It is indeed, indeed a Herculean task to plan and program the academic schedule. Kudos to your relentless efforts to carry on the program without any break. The team deserves, deserves a great appreciation for planning and executing the program in a spectacular way. Thank you, Lagan Nagalichmi. This is my friend Kausik Yoginath. Online anesthesia as a concept has grown strong over the past year with renowned faculty taking classes on a weekly basis on important and a lot of times difficult to understand concepts was an ingenious method to connect budding anesthesiologists and clarify concepts to them. 50 classes in a year is a big landmark indeed. This remarkable achievement would not have been possible without a dedicated behind the scheme team, hats off to Dr. Edward Johnson sir and the team for the lovely organization. Time has flown over the past, but each and every one of us as a participants has been the pilot of the flight, which is on remarkable journey. Wishing all the very best for many successful ventures to this team. Thank you, Kaushi. And very good friend of mine, Tushar Joksi from Baroda. Congratulations for 50 webinars and 100 hours of academic meet. You are a true teacher and academic buddy. Thank you, Tusha. This is from Santi Palraj from Tanjore Medical College, Professor Narachodi. Online analysis series, a novel initiative, and first of its kind in analysis academic program, meticulously planned and perfectly executed, was a great source of learning for students. All credit goes to Dr. Edward Johnson and his team for completing the Herculean task of 50 classes. Lucky to be one of the speaker. Congratulations and well done, sir. Thank you, madam. And this is from Professor Sivakumar from Pondicherry, PIMS Professor and HOD. It's a great work, selfless service in teaching postgraduate and sharing knowledge among your fellow colleagues to do this consistently and so long needs dedication and passion. I really appreciate and admire your enthusiasm and passion in teaching postgraduate, sir. Kindly continue this good work to make our budding anesthesiologists achieve great success in their careers. I wish you good health, long life to continue your good work. Thank you, sir. This is from uh, Ravind, Ravinder, Professor Hachuri of Anesthesiology, RVM Institute of Medical College from Laksam, Laksam Akkapali, City District, Telangana. Hats off to you, sir. We are all knowing how much hard is the task to you have taken up and achieved success in the form of enlightening us and clarifying us the basic and advanced concepts. Thank you, sir. This is Nirmala Devi, madam. He is, she is my one of my teacher working in Velaman Medical College. Hi, Edward. You have been teaching anesthesia for postgraduate students. It's very useful for postgraduates as well as consultant anesthesiologists. Postgraduates are gaining more and more knowledge. The way of your teaching is very good. And your teaching brings them a clear view of the topic. Admits your busy schedule, you are doing a great job. It's a rare to find this kind of dedication and hard work these days. Once again, I congratulate on your excellent and fabulous work. It is quite rare to find such an amazing, talent, enthusiastic person. May God bless you with good health, peaceful, long life to reach many more friends. Thank you, madam. This is Ravi Kumar, Professor of Malabar Medical College, Calicut. 
Yes, sir. Wonderful and useful classes to students and teachers. Thank you. This is Geeta, Associate Professor from Navodhya Medical College, Raichu. Hats up to you. It is not an easy task. Spending time with academic is very difficult. Needs lots of dedication to become an excellent teacher like you, sir. Conducting quiz for the PGs every Sunday grade, sir. On World Anesthesia Day, conducting quiz to frame questions on one day is difficult for us. Whatever teaching notes from this group, I say pages to write, keep it in notebooks, helps a lot in both theory and practical exams. Thank you a lot, Dr. Edward Johnson, sir, for enlightening us with your excellent knowledge. Thank you, madam. This is Karthik Narayanan, senior assistant professor from Bellur Medical College, Bellur. Amazing and awesome work. Informative. Please continue this marvelous journey. This is Ruba Holgande, assistant professor from Nijalingappa Medical College, Balkan, Karnataka. It gives immense pleasure to be a part of these academic classes. Very grateful for your timely guidance and proper coverage of different topics for postgraduates. Even me as a faculty have got its benefits immensely. Really commendable for all the faculty for taking the precious time on Sunday to educate us. Thank you once again. This is my class, my MBBS classmate working in Qatar, Premalata. It is great work and appreciate your dedication and determination to train the PGs. Apart from PGs, we are also updated and well informed. Great work, John. Very proud of you. Uh, this is uh, Prema Rajagopal. He is a senior consultant from Tindukal. Dr. Edward Johnson, his online analysis sessions have helped us to update and during the pandemic season. His choice of eminent speakers had some with experienced ones and youngsters. He elevated Tamil Nadu weekly webinars to a greater heights, but a standard. His practical in depth analysis of the several different topics made us Southeast. He is mentioning Southern people, I think. Southeast, very proud. He surely attracted a big crowd. Oh man, a teacher of his caliber. We have reasons to celebrate a gem from the southernmost tip of the subcontinent. He is a precious teacher. Godson. On his 100th hour on Christmas Day, he conducts a CME even today, speaks volumes of about his dedication with absolutely no interruption. Seniors, juniors from all over the India speaks on recent new topics well covered. We were yearning for Sunday mornings. When we missed, we went to YouTube recordings. His respect to seniors, awesome. Humility, thy name is Dr. Edward Johnson. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we will see some of the feedback from the postgraduates. Dr. Aimin Win, he is from Myanmar. He is a regular attendee of our program. Sir, I genuinely appreciate how incredible you are and your hard work is imperative to the organization. May you continue to success, sir. This is Vaishnavi. This online platform uh, reaching out so many budding anesthetists. You have to change this one. What? Okay, so this online platform reaching out so many budding anesthetists has been very helpful. Anesthesia is a very new subject to all of us when compared to any other subject because we are not ex exposed to its other subjects during our EBBS days. This platform has been a great learning resource for us, teaching us and clearing our doubts. Information provider has always been up to date with the reference quoted and put forward so well with such beautiful framed questions and images. Being within a hand's reach on your phones, on our phones and tabs, has been very helpful, making it easily accessible and to read on the on the go, be it while traveling or especially when we are in the operating rooms. I am grateful to Dr. Edward Johnson, sir, everyone involved in this amazing hearing learning program. Looking forward for more information and more learning to enhance my knowledge about anesthesia always on this platform. 
she has rightly pointed out i have started this program because most of our project post graduates are spending their time only in the social media so i thought of teaching through the social media so it will be easily reached our post graduates vaishnavi thank you so this is from nigeria i don't know how to pronounce his name is pew thank you sir for all this group has been very beneficial to me this is from pakistan dr imran it's a such a healthy platform that due to it due to it we are able to clear many concepts which were either not clear before or were not having any perspective in our mind so these are uh, postgraduates feedback from various parts of the india and these are the feedback from tamil nadu postgraduates so I, our program is well received throughout the india and also overseas so it is a time to thank the sponsor akrulla the akrulla has uh, launched their pro product only in the july but they have started sponsoring our program in the june january itself it shows their uh, dedication to promote the education rather than the product thank you gangadhar sir tushar and sankar and it is time to thank the host a1 logics the founder pravin udha puttappa and shilpa mulki shilpa was always with us for the past 50 classes sparing her uh, busy sunday morning and behind the screen she has helped us a lot thank you shilpa i also thank the anasisia tv our partner pallavi landi madam and the technical expert rahul chobi they have taken up our program to the international level thank you anasisia tv and i also thank our team without our team this grand success is not at all possible i thank gomadi madam rajesh sir saprasad sir sarva vinodini shantini madam and guru sandhya for a wonderful backup we have given for the success of this program and i want to say thank you for all your viewer support and as at the same time i wish you all very happy so what is next so we are so far we have completed 100 classes mostly i have covered the post graduate topics so what is going to be the, the next year whether i am we are going to continue it or not so many of the feedbacks requested to continue this program so i thought we are going to continue this program as a anesthesia update for the consultant but the frequency will be once in a month so we are expecting your continued support in the future uh, endeavor also thank you to all the faculty and the viewers now we will go on to the scientific section i request uh, sir prasad sir please take over this scientific session hello good morning welcome all to this 100th session uh, at this outset i would like to wish uh, all our participants a merry christmas and the season's greetings and uh, this session on anesthetic management of antepartum and postpartum hemorrhage is going to be delivered by a very eminent speaker i welcome sunil t pandya sir for this session welcome sir thank you uh, to introduce sir itself is so inspiring uh, sunil sir has uh, finished his mbbs and md from osmania medical college and he has done his pdcc in uh, cardiac and neuroanesthesia from chitra tirunal institute in december 1996 the most important thing is, in 1997, he started Prerna uh, team anesthesia practice, which is the pioneer one, which, because in 1997, just after he finished his PDCC, I, I started this. Uh, where it's a time we might not even have thought about this. And uh, he has successfully taken up the team. And uh, he has also had uh, worked in many, many very prominent hospitals, like Fernandez Hospital, Century Super, Super Specialty Hospitals, and he now heads the anesthesia, perioperative medicine, and critical care team at AAG hospitals in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, such a very inspiring profile, sir. We are uh, really, we would like to follow you. And we are uh, eagerly awaiting to hear your talk on uh, antipartum and postpartum hemorrhage management, sir. Welcome, sir. Over to you, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva Prakash, for your kind words. And uh, thanks, Dr. Adar, again for giving me this privilege to be here on this platform, on an NSCI teaching uh, platform. I hope I do justice to your uh, thoughts. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, good morning all again. Uh, uh, welcome again on behalf of uh, ISA Kanyakumari and Edwards and his team on this online teaching program for postgraduates. Uh, I, the 100, it's my privilege to be the 50th uh, speaker for the 100 hour session. And uh, I think uh, I should be able to do some justice for the standards which Edward has uh, raised the bars for every, every session. So the topic that he was given to me uh, was sometime to be held in June for but some emergency in the family. I had to discontinue uh, in between and I'm doing the topic today. Thanks, Edward, for accommodating me again uh, at the end hour. Uh, so this topic today is, is for anesthetic management of APH and TPH, antipartum hemorrhage and postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, well, uh, a disclaimer, uh, no conflict of interest. Importantly, what I'm sharing today in my presentation is all the cases have been my personal experience and we have uh, uh, embraced with some evidence uh, and uh, what we do currently, it's not uh, uh, a textbook uh, matter, but it's my personal experience. So if we look at the mortality of uh, women in our country, it's uh, hemorrhage is a leading cause of metal mortality. Unfortunately, it occurs in a healthy woman who are ASA grade one at the time of conception and then subsequently pregnancy becomes ASA grade two as they advance in the, during a pregnancy. But it is one of the leading cause of metal mortality. This was a fantastic study done by Umaram from Chennai where they have uh, analyzed the maternal death in India from the urban, semi-urban, rural setups in the country to see whether there are any changes in terms of metal mortality and morbidity, different optic conditions, and where they have studied sepsis, hypertension, and hemorrhage. And hemorrhage was still the leading cause of metal mortality across all sections in the country. Some of the urban areas, preeclampsia, hypertension has taken over and sepsis has taken over, but by and large, hemorrhage is still the leading cause of metal mortality. If you look at the profiles of ICU admissions abroad, this was a wonderful paper by Dr. Uma Munur, <coughs> Kalprata Guntipalli. I don't know how many of you know Kalprata Guntipalli. She is an intensivist from Hyderabad, but settled in Texas, Houston. She heads an obstetric critical care unit at Houston now. And Uma Munur is an anesthesiologist turned intensivist. And they had produced this paper in uh, chest medicine in, uh, of course, this was in 2011. And hemorrhage was a leading cause of ICU admission in their unit. And if you look at our ICU data, like Fernandez Hospital ICU data, uh, it is the second leading cause of ICU admission, obstetric hemorrhage. I mean, I talk obstetric hemorrhage is major obstetric hemorrhage where the patient ends up receiving massive transfusion. And if we compare the data over the years, like even 2020, hemorrhage is the second most cause of ICU admission. So what are all the causes of major obstetric hemorrhage, the antipartum hemorrhage and postpartum hemorrhage. Yes, the commonest, of course, is the postpartum hemorrhage. The four T's which we have been told about, or which we have been taught about, the tissue, the tone, the tissue, the trauma, and the thrombus. But I have included fifth T. Fifth T, uh, I'll be elaborating as I go uh, into the further into the lecture. But in a brief, fifth T is nothing but shift the patient to theater early so that you can stabilize the mother early. So fifth T is transfer to theater early rather than waiting and managing in the labor room or in the ward. And the major cause of optic hemorrhage, of course, are placental causes, the previous and the morbidly adherent placentas, the vasa previous, the abruption, the cooler uterus, the help syndromes, the acute fatal of pregnancy, amyloid fibromorism, IUFD, sepsis, and others. I'm including anemia as a cause of major optic hemorrhage, which contributes to most, most of this condition, but anemia per se also is responsible for hypotonic uterus post-delivery. So it can contribute, plus also it induces uh, postpartum hemorrhage. In addition, obstetric induced coagulopathy like we see in hepatic failure following uh, AFLP or HELP syndrome or any of those viral hepatitis or sepsis induced hepatic failure, or hepatitis EA are still not uncommon in our countries because tropical diseases are still affecting during our seasonal variation. We see dengue hemorrhagic fever, leptospirosis, uh, uh, von Willebrand disease. Uh, yes, uh, th these are all the things we inject. Well, yeah, we have on an average every two months one von Willebrand case uh, complicating pregnancy. And of course, uh, uh, with the advancement in the 
and the infertility treatment, we are getting more and more elderly gravidas with complex uh, thrombophilic patients who are on anticoagulants, antipartum period. Obviously, uh, they bleed, and especially patients with uh, metallic heart valves uh, who have uh, who are on uh, and oral anticoagulants, uh, they they sometimes bleed. So, when how do we plan for anesthesia in a patient who has a potential to bleed or who is going to bleed? Uh, uh, or who is bleeding already and we need to plan anesthesia. So you may be called for a parturient to, to give anesthesia for a parturient who has been bleeding on hemorrhagic shock or you may be called for a uh, anesthesia to, uh, to give anesthesia to a parturient who is likely to be like morbid adherent placenta or uh, probably uh, anticipated blood loss uh, like uh, hypotonic uterus passivity of PPH and other things. So when we consider uh, anesthesia part, we need to look at the following five questions. What is the likelihood of major optic hemorrhage perioperatively? Is it low or high? If it is high, then yes, uh, straight away we go for general anesthetic, which is much more uh, stable. And if the patient is bleeding torrentially, hemodynamically unstable, then what should be our anesthetic strategy? Patient is bleeding, but still relatively stable. Can I manage and continue under spinal or CSC, which I have already given? Uh, these are the decisions which are very important, which are very relevant. We, we all have come across where we have given spinal and subsequently patient lands up for uh, major optic hemorrhage. At what time you want to put a tube or whether you want to continue in the spinal. Uh, uh, simple decisions sometimes, but sometimes they are critically uh, uh, important as well. But most importantly, it is always the assessment of airway and back, which is very, very important. Like suppose if I am planning a cesarean section who in a patient who is likely to bleed torrentially like morbidly adherent placenta with a difficult airway. I don't want to struggle with putting a tube into the trachea when the patient is bleeding because my concentration should be on maintaining blood loss or maintaining intravascular fluid volume. So in this case, straight away, I will go for general anesthesia, planned general anesthesia. But suppose if I see a patient is intubatable airway, relatively easy airway, and then I would definitely go for regional if there is no contraindication. And SOS basis, I turn into uh, give uh, convert into uh, general anesthetic uh, because it's a easily intubatable airway. Uh, but when the patient bleeds, do not struggle for airway. Bottom line. Other important factors that govern your decision is anemia, low platelets, critical platelets, where with the regional is contraindicated, or patients with bleeding disorders like hemophilias. Uh, and as I said earlier, preeclampsia has helps syndrome where the platelets can sometimes fall to critical levels where regional is contraindicated, amniotic fluid embolism, dengue, and of course, uh, any of those patients where regional may be a of questionable uh, risk. So uh, all these are all the conditions where you need to take a call like placenta previa in a <clears throat> primary gravida. I will not be happy with just simple placenta previa and primary gravid. I want to know the localization of placenta. Is it anterior placenta? Is it a battle lower placenta where the placenta covers the ent uh, entire os and goes posteriorly or is a posterior placenta previa? Posterior placenta previa may not bleed because the when the obstetrician delivers the uh, uterus to the lower segment, the placenta is not in the way, but posterior segment of uh, uterus, they don't retract, they don't contract and there will be constant ooze. Sometimes this ooze can lead to significant fall in hemoglobin and fall in blood loss. So posterior placenta previa is an entity should not be ignored. Then of course, abruption placenta, abruption placenta, partial abruption, total addition, scar dehiscence. Most of the scar dehiscence are fibrous scar dehiscence. There is not much of bleeding. Uh, bleeding. But suppose there is a traumatic scar dehiscence or a, 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 a patient in active labor and the scar dehiscence and uterines are involved or any of those angles are involved, then the patient can have torrential hemorrhage. And sometimes simple procedures like manual removal of placenta or third stage of labor, uh, a focal adherent placenta can lead to torrential bleeding. Past history of postpartum hemorrhage is very, very important because past history of atonic PPH, the recurrence rate is quite high. And of course, when you have a grand multi over additional uterus like polyhydramnios or multifetal pregnancies like twins and triplets. Of course, we don't see triplets and quadruplets now uh, because of uh, fortunately fetal reduction surgeries. But yes, sometimes we do come across uh, over additional uterus because of polyhydramnios, especially diabetics, GDMs. And of course, unruptured ectopic, where there's a potential to bleed. A word of caution, a primary gravida, uh, especially may not be a primary because they may be having a concealed pregnancy history of MTP uh, or myomectomy or metroplasty. So any scar in the uterus in terms of DNCs or myomectomies and metroplasty 
can lead to adherence plateau percent and you have to keep this keep keep this fact in mind and you need to take this history in confidence uh, when the mother is around when the in-laws are not there because they are often a uh, concealed history and we have had uh, this patient landing and we land up in dorm and subsequently when we probed uh, post operatively then they gave a history when we gave a when we took the patient and the mother in confidence without in-laws presence so uh, certain things uh, we need to do in a very subtle way to save the family as well other important uh, factors that uh, land up in peripartum hemorrhage is morbidly adherent placenta the scar ruptures the stuck placenta the coexisting vascular diseases like large aortic and splenic aneurysms we had a good a good amount of series of aortic aneurysms splenic artery aneurysms uh, complicating pregnancy uh, and they which they have a potential to rupture especially if they are allowed to go into spontaneous labor and of course uh, grade 3 and grade 4 unbanded esophageal varices these are all late referrals to our unit where the patient uh, patient comes with a cirrhotic portal hypertension non cirrhotic portal hypertension but has grade 3 grade 4 varices they are not been banded and being a fernandes hospital being a uh, dedicated perinatal center we don't have interventional uh, advanced uh, gastrointestinal uh, uh, ge interventions are there and you you need to have a strategic plan you need to have those appropriate things taken tubes or to to resuscitate this patient in case they bleed because we have actually remember a couple of patients they ruptured the varices uh, uh, peripartum period and of course of clinical coagulopathy due to any cause and uh, anesthesia in class 4 hemorrhage when the patient has lost 50% of blood volume or when the patient has landed with cardiovascular and embolic shock like amniotic fluid embolism or there is complete uterus uh, complete abruption cobular uterus uterine inversion uterine inversion is one entity where you see all types of shock you see hypovolemic shock hemorrhagic shock neurogenic shock and of course they have severe pain and they, they, they so multiple shocks are seen in, in one entity and uh, uterine ruptures uh, or ruptured ectopic or any reason where the gc is less than 8 Uh, especially we have had several cases uh, last couple of years due to covid uh, severe ards uh, patients landing up in pph or patients with neurotrauma or polytrauma or any coincidental space occupying lesion uh, with poor gcs so all these things you need to take into consideration when you are planning anesthesia like class 3 hemorrhage subclinical epinephrine fluid embolism indwelling epidural catheter cited for labor analgesia now uh and landing up in major obstetric hemorrhage do you, would you want to continue epidural because patient is relatively hemodynamically stable but patient is bleeding so all these things yes we need to keep in mind when we are planning <clears throat> if you look at our pac chart at uh, fernandes hospital one of the investigation finding is location of placenta which have included this is very very important because uh, as a part of pac many a times uh, uh, our uh, colleagues they don't have habit of looking at ultrasound report reading the ultrasound report but make it a point to see because sometimes there might be a communication lapse on the obstetrician to the anesthesia team especially freelance practitioners and on table you detect there is anterior low lying placenta or a placenta anterior low lying placenta previa in previous cesarean section so all these anterior low lying placenta with previous cesarean section or previous scar should be considered as placenta or invasive placenta or morbidly adherent placenta unless until put otherwise and manage accordingly this this uh, pac and this point uh, one of, should this should be one of the take home point other important time uh, pa- point uh, when you plan anesthesia uh, uh, is a pre anesthetic check yes you need to do a airway assessment and back assessment for every scenario anatomically easy airway anatomically challenging airway physiologically challenging airway when i say physiologically challenging airway we know that when the patient has lost 50% of blood volume they are acidotic they are hypothermic and uh, uh, sometimes the ph is 7 and 7.1 and if you have to put a uh, tube with little fentanyl or midazolam it leads to this history or it leads to uh, cardiac arrest because when you have deranged physiology like septic shock with hemorrhage uh, with severe metabolic acidosis the moment you give even little fentanyl or midazolam there, there is there is vasoplegia intense vasoplegia and they go in for shock so uh, planning uh, intubation in anatomically physiologically challenging scenario is very very important and we know that despite 6 hours of fasting they have the inherent tendency for risk of aspiration so acid aspiration prophylaxis is mandatory and of course always look for spine musculoskeletal abnormalities exam in the back if you are male anesthetist have a nurse by, by uh, at the in the psc room and examine the back because we have seen many times 
uh, scoliotic back or a patient with uh, you know, I have got beautiful uh, pictures, but I don't want to. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, not this uh, presentation to show those pictures. Uh, but importantly, examination of back is very very important because sometimes you miss scoliotic spines or uh, rotated spines or instrumentation in the back where region is literally contraindicated. So all these things uh, you need to remember. And of course, obstetrical contraindication for neuroaxial block also have to be kept in mind. So in a nutshell, you have a simple airway, simple spine. The choice is yours. You can decide either GA or spinal. But generally, all patients in our hospital, the protocol is start under neuroaxial anesthesia so that you can establish maternal bonding. But yes, it's a demanding spine intubatable airway. We still prefer uh, regional anesthesia like the combined spinal epidural or uh, spinal, uh, even if you're anticipating major obstetric hemorrhage. If it's a demanding airway and easy spine, uh, we straight away go for GA, especially when you're anticipating major blood loss. And of course, in this case, there is no choice, but go for planned GA because when you go for planned GA, SS, I mean, you, you, you can spend some extra time if it is needed for intubation using a video laryngoscope or fiber optic uh, scope. But importantly, always ease of securing airway, ease of intubation, post of ventilation, all have to be planned meticulously before you give anesthesia to these past unions. Uh, it, is, it is very important. And importantly, the risk of risk of difficult airway aspiration versus remote risk of unaxial hematoma. As I say, remote risk of unaxial hematoma because most of these bleeding parturient, they go in for peripartum coagulopathy, peripartum thrombocytopenia, deranged INRs, and what is the risk of hematoma I'm going to incur uh, or ACRU is very, very minimal, but that has to be uh, kept in mind. So if you are planning a GA for a bleeding parturient, like either because of antipartum hemorrhage or a postpartum hemorrhage, Yes, informed consent is mandatory. Blood transfusion consent is mandatory. The blood transfusion consent, consent, massive transfusion consent, especially when anticipating major blood loss, is mandatory. And this consent of blood transfusion is valid uh, as per the NABH for 24 hours. So suppose if you are transfusing blood again the next day, a fresh consent has to be obtained. Acid respiration prophylaxis is again a mandatory uh, checklist before you induce the patient. Uh, I have a baseline ABG always better because it gives you not only the lactates and the hemoglobin, but also gives you the electrolytes, which are very important. And see that the enough blood and blood components are reserved. As a rule, uh, in adherent placentas or this thing, uh, we reserve uh, 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 MTP pack one that is four packs and four FFPs are reserved uh, and kept ready for uh, disbursement. And of course, keep the emergency drug to wide bore venous access. When I say wide bore venous access, at least 116, 118 is mandatory. Uh, no pink, no blue, no yellow. And art line, preferably, if you're anticipating major hemorrhage, early arterial line is mandatory. You don't transduce the line, insert the line, strap it. And when you, when you feel the patient is bleeding, then you can transduce the line. Because when the patient bleeds and lo loses 50% of blood volume, then you struggle to um, uh, secure an IV, uh, arterial line. You may waste considerable time unless you have uh, help and sometimes uh, you, you, it delays resuscitation. So have a prophylactically placed arterial line, especially when you're anticipating major obstetric hemorrhage. Call for experienced help early uh, rather than calling at the nth minute. And see that the surgical safety checklist is done so that uh, uh, we don't compromise on the maternal safety. Antibody prophylaxis generally in our hospital give uh, uh, kefiroxam 1.5 grams at the time of uh, induction or when you give spinal single dose uh, for elective cases. Uh, and ETCO2 is mandatory, of course. And uh, in patients, when the patient, if you are giving anesthesia to a bleeding parturient who has lost uh, 30 to 40 percent of blood volume, then do not use propofol or thiopentone. Go for ketamines. Succamethonium, rocuronium, sucomatex, of course, with a little bit of metazolem and fentanyl. But again, ketamine with metazolem, again, is myocardial depressant. Ketamine with 50% of blood loss itself is a myocardial depressant. Um, I'll come to it a little later. But yes, uh, the ketamine also has to be given slowly in a parturient who already is bleeding profusely. Okay. So, and subsequently, because we know that in an initial agent like sevoflurane or uh, uh, desflurane or isoflurane, whatever you're using, uh, may not be uh, 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 there because of uh, low volumes, low, low blood pressure. We put these patients on KFM mixture, wherein we take 200 milligrams of ketamine plus 200 micrograms of fentanyl plus 5 milligrams of midazolam and 50 ml syringe and run at 5 to 7 ml per hour. This induces 
uh, adequate uh, sleep and adequate, uh, it prevents adequate awareness. And when we do BIS monitoring, you maintain BIS around uh, uh, 40 to 55 range, which is adequate enough to knock down the awareness uh, in part students. And of course, when the patient bleeds, what you need to do is damage control resuscitation, not overzealous resuscitation. Damage control resuscitation. Uh, I'll come to it again later. But monitoring and prevention of lethal quad and low threshold for post-operative ventilation. This is what I was talking about. If you are maintaining KFM mixture, the BIS, that is bispectral index monitoring that you maintain is around 50, uh, less than 55, uh, which is good enough uh, for adequate depth of anesthesia uh, is what is achieved because if you just switch off uh, uh, the international agent because the patient is bleeding, uh, then uh, you, the, the risk of awareness is there. And if you look at the NAP5 audit, NAP5 audit is National Anesthesia Project Audit. I think it is, I remember it is NAP5, which was an awareness of an under anesthesia. The incidence of awareness in obstetric patients is almost about 3 to 5 percent, very, very high. So you have to keep this uh, uh, factor in mind. Uh, a patient may be pain free, but uh, she may be aware. So, log knocking down of awareness is very, very important. Importantly, as an anesthesiologist and perioperative physician, whenever you're dealing with massive obstetric hemorrhage on table and uh, giving anesthesia for bleeding per student, remember a few important things which are very relevant. All these patients who receive massive transfusion, they are prone for post-operative lung injury, trialis and tacos, transfusion associated acute lung injuries, transfusion associated circulatory overload, tacos, and all these patients, they warrant lung protective ventilation. So conventional ventilation of 8 to 10 ml of tidal volume is no longer recommended even for ASA grade 1 patient for a non obstetric surgery also. So lung protective ventilation should be the norm wherein we give about 6 to 7 ml per kg of predicted body weight, not the actual body weight, predicted body weight. Restrictive fluid strategy, permissive hypotension, the concept of permissive hypotension should be followed. Uh, normothermia is very important because when we are giving massive transfusion, massive fluid infusion, the temperature drop is very, very significant, very fast, very rapid, and maintenance of uh, normothermia is relevant because we know that hypothermia can cause coagulopathy, hypothermia can cause acidosis, and the vicious circle of coagulopathy, acidosis, hypothermia can lead to the circle of death. So temperature management, again, should be one of the single most important point uh, in, in your uh, anesthetic management. Yes, serial ABGs are very, very important because we know that massive transfusion can cause hypercalcemia, can cause hyperkalemia, can cause hyperlactatemia, can cause metabolic acidosis and prevention and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis if you are giving excessive overzealous normals and uh, fluids. So uh, ABGs, when I say serial, that means at least once in two hours or once in every, once every hour when the patient is bleeding or when you are resuscitating uh, has to be done. If you don't have the facility of doing ABGs, at least get once uh, once or twice during the surgical period. And if you feel the patient has lost more than 50% of blood volume, you are given massive transfusion, then yes, elective ventilation should be the norm, at least till the patient normalizes, till the patient bleeding ceases, because many a times the surgeon, they close the abdomen with oozy abdomen and sometimes the there is a risk of re expiration. So, if there is a risk of re expiration or if there is a pack in the abdomen, then better to plan for elective ventilation. If you don't have facility for elective ventilation, if you're doing a, if this, all these things happen in nursing home level, alert your tertiary care center, the anesthesia, the critical care team, the obstetric team, so that as soon as this damage control resuscitation is done, patient is stabilized and transfer in a stable condition to a higher center. Because we don't want her to lose her life during transit. Very important. And once the patient stabilizes, DVT prophylaxis is very, very important. And as I said, as a protocol, prevention of post-operative pulmonary complication strategies. And prevention of post-operative pulmonary complication strategies starts with preoperative uh, spirometric exercises. If the patient has COPD, of course, this, this, is the, this is a healthy population. We don't see that. But intraoperative lung protective ventilation, then lung recruitment maneuver before you extubate the patient. Very important because we are given massive transition, prolonged surgery. At least the physiological shunt, the VQ shunt, which is normally about 7 to 10%, can go up to 25 to 30 to 35%. And we need to minimize this shunt, minimize this death lactase. So lung recruitment maneuver, is very important. How do you give lung recruitment maneuver? Is sustained 
peep of at least 25 cm of water for about 45 to 50 seconds uh, is very important but yes yes there is a small risk of uh, uh, rupturing gullet especially the patient is an asthmatic or they have family history of spondylitis pneumothorax you have to be careful but this is very important so when you plan a spinal anesthesia or a neuraxial block and in a patient who has potential to bleed how do we go about yes as i said informed consent alternate plan has to be discussed this is a part of uh, your routine pre patient education during pac so when you are planning neuraxial block like either spinal anesthesia or combined spinal epidural anesthesia alternate plan b has to be explained in case of uh, uh, bleeding in case if the spinal fails or if the cac fails then of course there is said transvenous consent as well as spinal prophylaxis uh, all these things are very very important and it is important then to monitor nasal capnometry i am very fascinated by capnometry uh, because capnometry is one instrument that only that tells you in addition to the ecg which gives us continuous ticking that patient is alive capnometry gives us a continuous ticking that patient is breathing which is very important because once the patient is closed under the drapes and sometimes you give a little bit of midazolam or this to to la anxiety and you will not be able to monitor the chest movements and ecg pulse oximeter uh, before the seizures or before they become bready or this thing uh, uh, there is a gap of almost about 45 to 50 seconds and we know that pulse oximeter takes an average of at least 6 to 7 pulse beat before it gives the value of uh, uh, 98 or 99 so you need to remember this lag in pulse oximeter so uh, and ecg before it seizures or before it become bready when the patient stop breathing it takes a little time so nasal capnometry is mandatory uh is mandatory you get a simple nasal cannula uh, which has now which can be connected to the capnometer a uh, regular capnometer but this is very very important especially we have made it a mandatory protocol even if you are doing a as a grade 2 routine elective cesarean section or this thing if you are giving a nasal capnometer I mean, nasal cannula put capnometry monitor so that when it once it becomes a norm it becomes a safety culture so nasal capnometry should be one of the second uh, take home from uh, uh, today's talk call for help early So and of course, don't compromise on the surgical safety checklist, antibody prophylaxis. Uh, we have taken a norm now. Previously, it was under care of, care of surgeon, but now anesthesiologists start taking a. a, a uh this basically is a prevention of ssi surgical site infection and of course uh, spinal uh, our protocol is 8 to 10 milligrams of bupivacaine with fentanyl and generally we give morphine for all cases uh, one to 100 to 150 micrograms of morphine and this dose generally the respiratory depression uh, is very very uncommon i have not seen so far but yes we need to have uh, naloxone available in the ward and generally we keep our patient under our radar for at least uh, uh, 24 hours and suppose if the patient has labor epidural converted to cesarean section uh, in a patient who has potential to bleed then yes uh, 2% lidocaine uh, with adrenaline and fentanyl and bicarb is what we give combination uh, when i say potential to bleed and uh, epidural uh, for labor these are all the patients who had history of previous history of postpartum hemorrhage or previous history of hypotonicity or family history of uh, pph so where uh, normal delivery is not a contraindication and uh, generally we give epidural uh, we, we for most of the cases it is about 60% of our patient deliver under uh, epidural analgesia and of course not to forget the thing which i have already mentioned so either you can plan uh, epidural or combined spinal epidural and generally we use continuous saline flush technique which is nothing but uh, to minimize bloody taps we know that the incidence of bloody taps uh, the inadvertent uh, cannulation of epidural catheter into the venous uh, epidural uh, venous plexus or batson's plexus is almost about 5 to 7% in obstetrics so once you thread the once you identify the epidural space thread the catheter till the hubo point and once the catheter is till the hubo point Uh, connect a saline field syringe and start flushing the catheter and advance the catheter simultaneously so while doing this it's basically you are doing a uh, hydral lavage and uh, the tip of the catheter if any blood vessel is there it sways away and you can minimize blood attack this is very important because most of these patients of major obstetric hemorrhage or patients who are on coagulant anticoagulants or this thing they have a tendency to bleed you can minimize blood attacks you can give sequential csc or you can give non sequential csc or you can give single shot spinal or whatever technique you want but importantly see that when you are in the patient bleeds intraoperatively you give targeted resuscitation <clears throat> prevent hemodilution because hemodilution also can cause coagulopathy and prevent some nethelcoatl safety net safety net is nothing but 
watching for signs and symptoms of neuroaxial hematoma because sometimes epidural catheter can come out spontaneously in when the platelets are low postoperatively and you need to keep this in uh, keep this in mind so we always secure the catheter uh, with clamps so that the catheter comes out at the desired time i must tell you that these clamps again uh, we have seen couple of times or many times the catheter sometimes comes out with the clamp also so uh, you have to keep this in mind but yes definitely some securement uh, of the epidural catheter has to be done so that was in brief about uh, any planning of anesthesia but more importantly as an anesthesiologist we have to be thorough with the abc's of maternal resuscitation in obstetric hemorrhage and obstetric hemorrhage is a major obstetric hemorrhage can be defined as a catastrophic hemorrhage where the hemoglobin drops to critical levels or it's also synonymous with critical hemorrhage or a torrential hemorrhage where the patient loses blood volume in just few minutes because we know that uh the term gravid uterus receives 25 to 30 percent of cardiac output and if it is a multifetal pregnancy uh polydistended uterus uh, overhead i mean polyadamnios the cardiac output you have to add another five percent so almost 800 to 1000 ml per minute so uh, if the patient remains atonic for five minutes you can have virtual exsanguination the mother loses the entire blood volume in just about three to seven minutes so when you have such a magnitude of hemorrhage looming at you surviving the blood loss and maintaining circulation at the head end is what is important while the surgeon simultaneously uh, stop and control the hemorrhage so maintaining circulation from our side and measures to stop and control hemorrhage from the surgical side have to go hand in hand so how do we survive the blood loss and i have developed a 10 commandment approach in my hospital wherein Uh, it, it is basically uh, this is our approach and what we do and what we follow so first and foremost is maintaining circulation and constitute a multidisciplinary team from our side from the anesthesia side and from the uh, surgeon side as well so they do their part we do our part why it is important our, our our part also is because there has to be one person or two people at the head end who will help the main anesthetist in terms of securing additional line in terms of securing uh, arterial line in some in terms of giving fluids warming the fluids and all those things and one person dedicated for assessing blood loss quantification of blood loss and liaising with the blood bank manager office manager so that the blood is appropriate uh, uh, blood comes to the theater very very important because if one person has to do all the things you may miss out certain things you may miss out giving calcium you may miss out uh, sending uh, labs you can miss out something sending blood gases all these things have to be uh, kept in mind and of course calculating allowable blood loss is very important uh, quantification of blood loss resuscitation of fluids defining end points of fluid resuscitation okay enough is enough now fluids i need to go for blood so what are the end points of fluid resuscitation when do you want to give blood and blood products how much to give what are the end points of blood and blood components uh, understanding fluid may flow mechanics uh, and of course uh, transfusion strategies monitoring and achieving microvascular hemostasis you may achieve a uh, 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 good uh, uh, hemocoagulation targets coagulation goals but patient still loses so achieving microvascular hemostasis is of paramount importance and post operative care eras protocols even in mmoh and bottom line the 10 step most important step of all the step is 3 c's and d's this is the one step which will prevent all those litigations and uh, problems communication counseling consent and documentation consent is important because many a times you end up sacrificing the uterus we have had at least uh, a few handful of cases where uh, we had to sacrifice the uterus in a primary gravida patient with iud uh, because that was considered to be uh, life saving so uh, and uh, imagine a patient in a general anesthesia adult patient cannot give consent for her uterus removal so how important it is to communicate and counsel the patient so major obstetric hemorrhage our aim is to maintain perfusion of important organs prevention of cerebral hypoxia prevention of uh, 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 tachycardia or bradycardia because tachycardia is better than bradycardia because the moment a patient bleeds and has bradycardia is a very ominous sign and of course try to prevent oliguria again if you see oliguria that means your resuscitation goals are inadequate so how do we maintain circulation the step one is call for help early multidisciplinary team is very important i was telling you uh this uh, uterine flow and patient can progress from class 1 to class 4 hemorrhage within few minutes and importantly because of the physiological reserve they have 50% of blood volume expansion happens in a term gravida patient and so patient may not have the classic telltale signs of hypovolemia until they lose about 30% of blood volume so subtle signs are 
tachypnea so don't do not ignore the tachypnea so if you see uh, the patient uh, may, may go to progress to class 4 within few minutes but blood pressure may be normal uh, may be partial marginally decreased but by the time it is decreased with tachypnea tachycardia patient already is progressed to class 4 so there are certain uh, bedside mathematics which are very important and simple thing is obstetric shock index osi is what we call it, the simple pulse rate by systolic blood pressure. So generally, if it is in the range of 0 0.5 to 0 0.9, the risk of major optic hemorrhage or resuscitation is less. But if the OSA is persistently more than 1.1 at 10 minutes or 1.1 at 30 minutes, that means 75% of these patients, they require massive transfusion. So you, you have to keep this in mind. And OSA is a simple bedside uh, mathematics. And other thing which uh, as an anesthesiologist, which we are uh, which do a day in and out is rule of 30s. When the increase in heart rate is more than 30, when the respiratory rate increases more than 30, especially under spinal anesthesia, in the regional anesthesia, and other than that is another important thing why I want nasal capillometry to be on. Or if there is a drop in systolic blood pressure more than uh, less than 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, mm. uh, more than 30 millimeters of mercury, you do not put less than 30 mill 30 ml per hour. And hematocrit, if you are getting it checked, uh, generally we have hemoq in our theaters, uh, then immediate action is necessary because these are the patients who bleed torrentially. Step two, uh, uh, step two and step three are quantification of blood loss. Very, very important. Quantification of blood loss is not assessment. Uh, because assessment, we know that 40% of blood loss in uh, obstetrics is uh, underestimated. And uh, we need to be very, very careful. So you need to uh, quantify the blood loss. Quantify the blood loss. Because the surgeons generally count what is seen in the uh, jars. But... Uh, what is there on the floor, what is there on the mops, what is there on the table. These are the things that are ignored and we need to keep this in mind. Also not to forget the specimen loss because we know that 70% to 88, 70% of the weight of the uterus or the that is remote is nothing but blood. So you need to weigh the specimen and also that also is very important when you're calculating blood loss. So once you are uh, quantifying the blood loss, our aim is to restore the circulating fluid volume either with fluids or with uh, blood and blood components but it is important that you maintain the circulatory blood volume so first and foremost is fluid the crystal resuscitation our aim is to maintain adequate intravascular volume adequate oxygen carrying capacity adequate clotting function that we prevent coagulopathy because of over zero resuscitation pay maintenance of uh, uh, electrolyte balance because we know that excessive over zero normal cell resuscitation can cause hyperplurbic metabolic acidosis and over zero uh, uh, i mean bl blood and blood components without replacement of calcium can cause hypocalcemia and of course there is a normal thermia. so the crystals are the mainstay and of which ringer lactate is the fluid of choice Normal strain also can be given, but not beyond two liters, because we know that hypertermic metabolic acidosis can set in, and that can be uh, deleterious. And we know that uh, of all the crystalloids, uh, they hardly they stay in water. I mean, intervascular compartment; they just escape to third floor, third, third space, and they don't stay in intervascular compartment. And role of colloids in major optic hemorrhage is uh, less, especially if there's a background sepsis, because we know that if you are giving, if the patient has sepsis and atonic PPH uh, during surgery, uh, do not give colloids. Do not give colloids. The only colloid that is recommended is albumin. If you are giving starch and if you are giving a, a gelofusin, uh, uh, then it can cause uh, acute kidney injury, anaphylaxis. You have to be cautious. Uh, and we know that normal serum osmolarity is 280 to 295. Normal serum osmolarity. And dextrose should be avoided because it is a very, very hypoosmolar solution. It can cause dyserythritemia. And over the last, uh, normal sinus resuscitation, as you can see, this was one of the patients who received uh, uh, almost three and a half liters of normal sinus. And you can see the chloride almost is one of one, 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 uh, three and uh, potassium is 152. So hypernatremia, hyperplurimic metabolic acidosis. So you need to approach judicious approach. Low volume resuscitation, maintain a palpable pulse. Do not restore normal blood pressure. A systolic BP of 90 is good enough. And maintain adequate perfusion. pH of less than um, more than 7.28 or less than around more than 7.3 is what is important. Yes, you can take the help of uh, uh, noradrenaline to uh, maintain the perfusion, but see that the clinical targets, if the patient is rear axial block, uh, she should be responsive to commands, she should be alert. If she's irritable, if she's restless, then better to put it. Do, do not allow that stage to come. Those are the signs of cerebral hypoxia. Very, very important. So, uh, understanding the critical blood loss and oxygen debt. This is, I've kept these slides, next four or five slides only for postgraduates. It is very, very important. 
If you look at the normal oxygen delivery to the tissue is 1000 ml. God has given us enough reserves, four times more than what we need. And if you look at the normal oxygen consumption is 250 ml per minute, but the supply is 1000 ml per minute. And we know that oxygen extraction ratio by the tissue is about 22 to 30 percent. Maximum happens in cardiac. So if you look at the oxygen content in the cardiac output depends on four parameters, circulating volume, which we maintain by giving crystalloids and sometimes colloids. Colloid, again, as I said, should not be given routinely, especially in sepsis. If the patient is a non-septic case, you don't have blood in hand, then probably 15 to 20 ml per kg of uh, low microwave starch can be given, but do not go beyond that because it affects uh, coagulation also. Maintaining of cardiac contract rate is very important. So that means main prevention of acidosis, prevention of hypothermia, and prevention of any drugs that can cause myocardial depression, like even bolus ketamine of 1.52 milligrams per kg, ketamine with benzodiazepine combination, or ketamine benzodiazepine with nitrous oxide. Uh, uh, if you're giving nitrous oxide oxygen uh, combination, they're all myocardial depression, and of course, inhalation agent. So maintenance of cardiac contract is very important, and maintenance of oxygen saturation hematocrit. So let us take this. This is the venous side. This is the arterial side of the circulation. And if you look at the 15 grams hemoglobin, of course, we don't see this value in a pregnant patient. But if you have a 15 grams, of, this is a, uh, these are the mathematics. Uh, I have taken this uh, chart from Edward Life Sciences uh, uh, website. But if you see when the, when the hemoglobin is 15 grams, cardiac output 5 liters in pregnancy, cardiac output is 7 liters. It is increased. And you see the oxygen delivery of almost 1000 ml. Let us say now hemoglobin patient bleeds torrentially and the hemoglobin drops to 4 grams, a critical level. And if you see hemoglobin drops to 4 grams, the oxygen delivery is 288 ml. As I said, oxygen extraction happens at, uh, at 22%. So if you see the, the normal oxygen extraction, uh, the normal oxygen extraction is less than 25 but if it is 25 to 50%, you can, you can measure this by taking sample from the uh, IJB tip. Uh, uh, it, increase, it shows increased extraction. And 55 to 75%, it shows increased lactate and cellular dysfunction. If the SCVO2 or if the oxygen extraction is more than 75%, then there is cellular death. So you have to remember that SVO2 of more than 75% is normal. 50 to 75% it shows increased extraction of oxygen and SVO2 that is EBG, VBG is from the IGV tip. If it is 25 to 50%, it limits the, uh, the these are the limit of extraction. It indicates there's lactatemia happening, the cellular dysfunction and there's cellular death if the SCVO2 falls to less than 25%. So uh, doing a blood gas from the central venous line is of paramount importance. So charting blood is very important at early point. The transient trigger should be raised appropriately. Do not allow hemoglobin to fall to critical levels. The critical level in pregnancy is 5.2 grams. In non-pregnancy is 4.8 grams, 4 grams. So when I say critical level, uh, critical level is nothing but the Krebs cycle, which is oxygen dependent cycle stops. So there is the aerobic metabolism no longer happens. The anaerobic metabolism that is the emder mera pathway, where the substrate is glucose, is converted to lactate and pyruvate. This lactate and pyruvate take go into Krebs Hanslet cycle to release 38 moles of ATP, of water, and carbon dioxide. Water is excreted through the urine and carbon dioxide exhaled through the lungs. So if you don't have oxygen, there is a pasture point at the mitochondrial level, PO2 and the mitochondria drops to less than five millimeters of mercury. Then this anaerobic metabolism sets in and you see more of lactate production. And if you still don't give blood, when the hemoglobin is critically ill, you take, you raise anotropes, you raise the vasopressors. Momentarily, you may improve cardiac output, but eventually what happens is the patient can go into irreversible vasoplegic shock. Irreversible. So we don't have to tilt the balance. So see that you need to maintain uh, adequate um, uh, uh, triggers, appropriate triggers. Do not allow this to occur. This was a patient, I still remember, a patient with mitral stenosis, moderate MS, uh, hemoglobin, uh, unanticipated uh, hemorrhage happened on table, and hemoglobin fell to 2.6 grams. Uh, of course, we could revert it uh, immediately. But Im importantly, what I want to convey is ETCO2 is a fantastic monitor. ETCO2 is a fantastic uh, monitor. And you can see when the ETCO2 volume decreases, with, despite putting a tube, there's an indicator that patient is losing volume. And you can also notice ST depression. So when the patient, even with the patient with normal coronaries, patient with normal coronaries, uh, if they bleed, if the hemoglobin drops to less than four grams, they have ST depression, myocardial ischemia. Upon that, you give eutotonics like uh, 
methyl ergometrin and sometimes they can induce coronary spasm and you have to be keep vigilant understanding fluid mechanics is very important because when the patient is bleeding like this there is no point in using this cannulas very important because when the patient is bleeding uh, uh, profusely uh, torrentially we need to aim at keeping the intravascular compartment at least 70% full and this can happen only if you have uh, 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 at least uh, 16 18 and uh, orange cannulas very very important of course i don't want to uh, go into the details but uh, appropriate size cannula is very very important so appropriate transient triggers in a parturient who is bleeding is do not allow hemoglobin to drop clinically to less than 7 grams raise the transient trigger at 7 grams in a patient who is bleeding mass massively so that you can get blood in hand and you can start appropriate blood and blood components and if you have the facility of uh, intraoperative cell salvage, nothing like it. Uh, Multi-specialty hospitals, they have these devices that Fernandes, we don't have what at AIG. Yes, we have the cell salvage mechanism, but we don't have options at AIG. Uh, so it's a paradox. So the, the, the dedicated perinatal centers, they don't have intraoperative cell salvage because the usage is less. And every cell salvage costs about 20,000 rupees, the disposable cost. But the beauty is, the oxygen carrying capacity of the red cells is preserved and immediately the 2-3 DPGs are well preserved and they, they carry, carry oxygen immediately. The moment the salvage blood goes back to the patient's circulation, it's very, very important. Uh, this is one of the thing, grim reality in our country. Uh, when we talk about massive transfusion, uh, the gross availability mismatch between the urban and rural setups. If you look at the blood donation, uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because the PGs uh, may not know that for every thousand people where the blood is required, there are only 30 donations. And this ratio drops to less than five in rural areas. So always at the time of PAC, encourage blood donation. The bank can give you money only if you deposit money in the bank. Okay, so blood, blood can dispense blood only when there is a, when they have blood and blood components. So you need to make a protocol that every cesarean section in our hospital who is a high risk, we send two donors to the blood bank. We don't have a blood bank, but we have liaison with four or five blood banks around the Fernandez hospital. And of course, keep your massive transmission protocols in hand. And the concept of hemovigilance, again, this from the postgraduate viewpoint is very important. Hemovigilance is the thin thing that is coming up uh, in um, major, most of the hospitals. And the concept of hemovigilance, hemovigilance is nothing but bidirectional tracking of adverse effects and adverse reaction because of blood transfusion. Bidirectional. So from the time of donation to the issue and from the time of issue to the patient transfusion. And so every blood that is received by the clinician, there should be a blood adverse form attached and we have to fill up this form back. So they send it back. Even if there is a no adverse effects, write no adverse effect and send this form back to the blood bank so that they have the registry. Other thing that you have to remember is DIC in a pregnancy a pregnant patient sets up rapidly, even a normal patient. Of course, they have help, AFLP or annual fluid embolism when coagulopathy is inherent. So that has to be kept in mind. So non-optic cause of coagulopathy or hepatitis, systemic sepsis, overzealous crystal dissertation causing the dilution coagulopathy, all have to be prevented. And lethal quad, quad is nothing but hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy is what we have been the taught the classical lethal triad, but the quad is hypocalcemia, which we tend to ignore, especially when you are giving more FFPs, more FF cryos, and more PRPCs without replacement of calcium. So, how do we raise a transmission trigger? When to order what? So, as I said, do not allow hemoglobin to fall less than 5.5 grams in pregnancy at its critical level. Raise the trigger at 7. And give supplemental oxygen, early endotracheal intubation and prevention of quad is very important. Do not, especially when the patient is bleeding like this, these are all uh, pictures from uh, of our past patients. But importantly, when the patient has lost more than 50% of blood volume, we go for pack cells and uh, components. So generally, prefer always leukodepleted blood cells. Again, leukodepleted blood cells, leukodepletion done in the blood bank, not while you are transfusing with a Paul blood filter, leukodepleted filter. Because by, if you are giving massive transfusion with a Paul leukodepleting uh, filter, uh, it goes very slowly. So leukodepletion has to be done by the uh, hemato uh, transfusion specialist in the blood bank. Why leukodepleted blood? Because we know that why do you want to give WBCs in PRB? PRBC can pack cells, the packed uh, RBCs contains WBC also. And WBCs are the one which are notorious for trallies. And why do you want to give a component for trally 
when there is not needed. So always prefer leukodepletion. Yes, it comes with additional cost. But if you look at the Western blood banks, they don't give a regular PRBC at all. The norm, when you ask for packed cells, it is always leukodepleted packed cells. And probably we need to move towards uh, that. Uh, whether you want to give whole blood or component, generally we prefer component therapy because getting a whole blood on an urgent basis is impossible. Uh, because more importantly, it contains, uh, if you're storing blood for beyond one week, uh, the 70, 50 percent of coagulation factors are lost. There are no platelets. What you have is only uh, packed cells and volume. So even you don't have component, uh, I mean, coagulation factors. So if you are giving FFPs, you are giving cryo, and you are giving PRBC, the yield of hemoglobin is better with PRBC. Yield, yield of coagulation factor is better with uh, FFPs and cryos. Generally, we do we prefer uh, irradiated blood. Ideally, if given a choice. Irradiated blood is preferred, especially if you have donors from the kith and kin. Do not give uh, blood donation from brothers, sisters, siblings, parents uh, to the patient because uh, it can cause um, uh, graft versus host disease. So one way to circumvent that is irradiation of blood. Uh, the, but again, in emergency, it has not. You don't have that much of time, but keep that point in mind. Again, we don't prefer female donors in the reproductive age group because they also carry allo antibodies from their partners. So always healthy male donors is the uh, choice. And if you can uh, have a, a, a NAD blood, that is nuclear amplification tested blood, uh, is important because you can reduce the window period of HIV, HBCG, anti-HCV to less than one week. So nuclear amplification test is again, it's not a mandatory protocol as per the NACO guidelines, but it is, it is, it helps us in uh, minimizing transfusion transmitted diseases like HIV, HPG, hepatitis, and anti HCV. So what goals should be uh, a hemoglobin of more than 7 grams, APTT should be less than 1.5 times the control, and platelet should be at least more than 80,000. Fibrinogen of more than 250 is what uh, our control and ABG is maintained that uh, a pH of more than 7.3. Very important. Just for the sake of uh, postgraduates, if you don't know the bachelor mathematics, uh, one uh, RDP or pool platelets gives 5,000 to 7,000 uh, uh, platelets, raises platelets by five to 7,000. And one SDP uh, raises 30 to 40,000. One pack cells, uh, again, uh, raises the hemoglobin one to 1.5 grams, uh, sometimes two grams also. It all depends on the body weight and the blood volume. Uh, need not be that one gram of uh, hemoglobin and one PRBC. It all depends on the body weight and blood volume. But keep this, uh, keep these simple things in mind. But importantly, FFP is group specific, SDP is group specific and type specific, and cryos are only group specific. And uh, we have an MTP protocol that is massive transfusion protocol. The moment you say MTP one, four PRBCs, four FFPs are issued, and automatically things for MTP two are ready in the blood bank, which means uh, they they'll screen for SDP. They give uh, they they'll be ready with six PRBCs, six FFPs, and eight cryos. You you have to remember that once you order FFP. The thawing time for FFP is about 25 to 30 minutes. So you have to keep that in mind. Never uh, thaw FFPs, never take frozen FFPs and keep it in the uh, warm water because it forms clumps and you'll not be able to transfuse them. So always thaw it uh, in the machine, in the blood bank, and that becomes uh, relevant, that becomes important. Achieving macrovascular hemostasis is of paramount importance because we know that fibrinogen and tranexamic acid play a very, very important role. So when the patient is, you are anticipating major optic hemorrhage, probably this is one case where you can give one gram of tranexamic acid. If the patient continues to bleed, repeat one more gram of tranexamic acid after 30 minutes. Beyond that, there is tranexamic acid, third dose and fourth dose are not necessary. In addition, fibrinogen. Yes. If the fibrinogen levels drop significantly less than 100, it indicates clot failure. And you have to maintain fibrinogen levels because pregnancy is a state of hyperfibrinogenemia and you have to maintain fibrinogen of at least 220 grams or milligrams uh, per deciliter. Uh, it's very important because we know that 150 to 250 milligrams is low for obstetric population. Less than 150 milligrams of fibrinogen per deciliter impairs hemostasis. Less than 100 milligrams poor hemostasis, and if, there is, if, they, if the fibrinogen is less than 50 milligrams, then there is no clot formation. And the sources of uh, uh, fibrinogen are FFPs, cryos, and fibrinogen concentrate. Yes, if you want to prevent volume overload, you can go for fibrinogen concentrates. They are available, uh, but importantly, um, expensive. Yes, I already mentioned about tranexamic acid. Give If you have point of care testing, nothing like it. Uh, take uh, targeted uh, volume replacement, blood replacement is, is ideal. 
but not many centers at Fernandez Hospital. We don't have at EIGF because we have it, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, not much of optic happens here. Uh, but importantly, uh, I must tell you that uh, if tag is not there, not to worry. What we do is we just take five ml of uh, blood in the syringe, keep it by the side of the patient uh, in the, on the table uh, horizontally, and after five minutes, kill the syringe. Uh, there, there was a beautiful study from Raichur. Uh, I remember it came in IJ or some of those Indian journal only. Uh, very fantastic study, and they could see that uh, you can see roughly you can see the clot formation. Very crude test, but nevertheless, uh, it's an important way to measure bedside coagulation. And always send PT, APTT, fibrinogen at least every second hourly during surgery. You have to remember that when you're sending a, a PT, APTT at zero hours, by the time you get the report, patient have bled another one liter. So correction has to be kept of this additional one liter of blood loss, which has happened in the interim period from the point of sending. So that, that dynamics have to be kept in mind. Uh, as I said, arterial line is very important. CVP is not essential initially. Yes, CVP line is not essential in the, uh, initially, but arterial line is very important because beat to bit monitoring is what is important because when you see this trace, hypovolemic trace, uh, you can see contact it is very well preserved. This is the patient, and of course, urine output is the best cardiac output monitor. We have unometer, uh, uh, which gives us a, a 5 ml even type, minimum, minimum blood, and unometer uh, is so sometimes you, you can use unometer or urometer to assess the blood loss, very, very important. But importantly, urine output maintenance is the crude or cardiac output, poor man's cardiac output. If you have a warm, low temperature, 0.5 ml of uh, kg per hour of urine. It's a good cardiac output. Your perfusions are good. But yes, always use this additional uh, methodology to assess the perfusion and lethal quad prevention is of paramount importance. Core temperature monitoring already I've discussed. I don't uh, uh, want to again uh, spend some time, but main, it is very important that you maintain, uh, give warm fluids. This is a uh, fluid warmer, you can give massive transfusion uh, through this warmer uh, cassette. The priming volume is almost about 230 ml of this cassette, but it's infrared warmer. And generally, we prefer infrared warmer over the blood uh, and water bath warmer because water bath warmer can sometimes uh, cause nosocomial infections because water bath can cause, uh, can arrive I and mean, bugs can be there. So as I said, the endpoints of transfusion, hemoglobin are more than seven grams. So ideally, yes, eight, uh, but not nine or not ten. Don't don't aim at hemoglobin of ten grams or hematocrit of thirty. Eight grams is enough. Even if the patient has cardiac uh, problem, not an issue. Uh, and platelets of more than seventy-five to eighty thousand. Fibrinogen of more than two fifty milligrams is what we desire. And choline lactates. Most importantly, do not extubate this patient on table because especially the patient is acidotic and hypothermic. Electrically ventilate. And as I said earlier in my introduction, if you don't have facilities, transfer her to a higher center or at least ventilate in the theater till the patient is warm or till the risk of re-expiration increases. Recommended factor 7A, again, for the sake of postgraduates, uh, hardly it is there. Of course, we have had a series of 17 cases in pregnancy where we have given RF7A. But yes, when all the measures fail, despite uh, normal correction parameters, despite normal thermia uh, and normal pH, if the patient is still oozy, then you can give a recombinant factor 7A. The dose is 40 micrograms to 90 micrograms per kg, which comes to around about 4 to 5 grams, sometimes 6 grams, 6 milligrams. And each 1 milligram is almost 40 to 50,000 rupees. So one dose correction, it costs almost about 2 and a half to 3 lakhs. Very expensive and not so cost benefit analysis, if you see, not, not very high. Cell salvage, definitely it's helpful. Plasma and blood substitutes, especially Jehovah's Witness. We've had many cases of Jehovah's Witness, uh, but once we explain and take a consent to the magistrate, they agree for blood transfusion. Yes, we don't have true Jehovah's, uh, at least in India, I have not seen. Uh, but when you discuss and elaborately, because uh, even the low-risk obstetric case, we don't know which patient is highly unpredictable. Uh, but uh, uh, but if you look at the literature, there have been uh, cases they have where they have managed blood and blood substitute in Jehovah's Witness, the major optic hemorrhage, uh, even critical hemoglobin. But again, there have been few maternal deaths also because of the patient didn't consent for blood transfusion. So you have to keep this in mind. If you have a Jehovah's Witness with uh, uh, anticipated major optic hemorrhage, involve a magistrate-based consent about blood transfusion because there's uh, something which is very, very relevant, very important. 
and of course not to forget our friendly sub specialty of radiologist and uh, uh, interventional radiologist because uh, many a times despite uh, doing peripartum hysterectomy there is a stump bleed or there might uh, be bleed inside and you need to have embolization or cat procedure so you have to keep that also in mind and post operatively you need to look for immediate transient complications like fluid overload trally transfusion transplant sepsis the transfusion transplant sepsis is highest with platelets and least with uh cryos and uh, ffps and prbc is the second most component because prbc is stored at 4 degrees to 6 degrees cryos are stored at minus 20 and minus 40 and uh, pr uh, pr platelets are stored at uh, the room temperature 25 degrees celsius on agitator they are not uh, frozen uh, because we know that platelets should not be frozen and the risk of transmission of infection highest with platelets so use platelets judiciously and just because this patient has had major hemorrhage long duration surgery they should be ambulated early because these are the patients who are prone for dvts and pulmonary complications and uh, i have as i said our protocol is uh, neuraxial analgesia is a uh, technique of choice in our hospital even in anticipated uh, hemorrhage and we convert them into ga and with good analgesia they are ambulated up and about and they recover very very fast and you can minimize uh, prevention and post operative pulmonary complications by early uh, spirometric exercises so just to conclude the anesthesia in a parturian who has a tendency or potential to bleed antepartum or postpartum cnb neuraxial block is the most preferred but yes risk versus benefit difficult airway versus ease of uh, spinal uh, uh, difficult back versus ease of intubation and uh, versus coagulopathy low platelets all these things have to be kept in mind uh, when you are uh, planning anesthetic technique general anesthesia is not mandatory for placenta previa or adherent placenta provided we do risk versus benefit analysis if you are ha having a difficult airway a, a very difficult airway and adherent placenta is there then planned ga is better okay bleeding parturian ga is a safe bet because we don't want uh, to activate epidural especially if they have despite they have indwelling catheter which you have put for labor analgesia the patient bleeds go for ga rather than activating epidural catheter because we know that sympatholysis sympathetic block can be difficult to uh, manage uh, with profound vasodilatation organ protective strategies very very important you are perioperative physicians you are intensivists and see that organ protection starts intraoperatively judicious use of fluids judicious use of uh, vasopressors inotropes because we know that vasopressors and inotropes can cause planting ischemia bowel ulcerations so have a low threshold for uh, um, arterial line and targeted resuscitation avoid nsaids especially the patients with coagulopathy numero uno for volume replacement is ringal lactate crystalloids and if you ask me balanced salt solutions should be preferred but ringal lactate is also good enough but over zealous fluid resuscitation should be avoided and hemorrhage drill should be carried out very frequently tranexamic acid should not be forgotten and fibrinogen uh, early cryos and ffp should be given for macrovascular hemostasis cell salvage devices radiological interventions are uh, at immense benefit in appropriate cases but importantly you have to prevent identify manage immediate complications short term complications and long term complications uh, following major optic hemorrhage when as a long term complications sheehan syndrome all these things are very very important so uh, uh, the last slide is dynamic assessment is very important and keep uh, replacing laboratory workup and triggers and endpoints have to be defined continuously so remember that blood is a bloody organ it's a fluid organ bloody is a blood is a bloody business use judiciously use appropriately transient triggers raise appropriately too much of blood too little of blood too late of blood are eternal perils hemovigilance is the need of the hour and minimize transient associated related complications very very important three c's and d's are excellent are very very important and all these things you can have in place provided you do regular drills every 4 months every 6 months you do this drills hemorrhage drills eclampsia drills and importantly introspection introspection of the outcome of uh, all your patients so bottom line uh, uh, we we don't have a blood bank but we get a bank transfusion at least uh, once in uh, uh, every week or two two cases every week and not a single death uh, so far so thank you very much for your patient hearing and uh, i'm open for questions but uh, just to inform you that next conference is in ahmedabad kindly register 
and uh, uh, the forthcoming workshops on optics simulation i'm doing uh, are as follows if anybody is interested uh, you can attend them thank you dr uh, edward for the opportunity and privilege uh, any questions i can take thank you sir wonderful presentation super sir sir you take yes, it yes sir thank you sunil sir that was a really very wonderful presentation the sensory presentation was uh, which is really apt uh, having you as speaker sir all the content was was very nicely arranged in good slides and very informative thank you very much sir mm -hmm. and uh, there were questions which are coming and i think you have covered this topic so well you could uh, you were answering all the questions as the questions were coming sir the uh, your yeah. first question is about uh, how to initiate the massive tra transmission protocol i think uh, you have a detailed it and how that mtp 1 2 and 3 goes on sir uh, what is restricted fluid therapy in bleeding patients sir so restricted fluid therapy is do not uh, aim at bp of 120 70 or uh, baseline blood pressure the baseline bp is 130 by 70 we yes. don't want to achieve those targets the restricted fluid therapy is try to achieve a palpable brachial pulse or a palpable radial pulse or at least a good plethysmographic pattern on a pulse oximeter probe if if you are seeing a good plethysmograph and a pulse oximeter probe in a warm patient is good enough because if you are giving if you are achieving a map of uh, 65 to 70 whatever the micro clots are formed at the microvascular level uh, you are dislodging those clots by over zealous fluid resuscitation so the micro clotting is prevented and you end up using more blood losing more blood so a restrictive uh, fluid strategy is nothing but uh, don't go for uh, excessive over zealous uh, fluid resuscitation you can just give assess the blood loss dynamically and early transfusion triggers do not wait till the hemoglobin drops to 5 grams raise the transfusion trigger to 7 grams because most of the obstetric hemorrhage or obstetric practice happens in nursing homes where you don't have blood banks so by the time you order blood and procure blood it takes at least about minimum 2 hours or uh, at least minimum 1 hour unless the blood is ready or uh, ready for dispensation so you have to keep this in mind and see that uh, the damage control resuscitation from the surgical side appropriate usage of uterotonics and all those things they go hand in hand simultaneously but uh, uh giving only crystalloid still the patient uh, bleeds is again should not be done so restrict fluids and raise appropriate transfusion uh, triggers appropriately at appropriate time thank you sir uh, the next question is on uh, how which quantification method of blood loss is the best what do you use sir because uh, the bucket one which we showed is yeah. really we don't uh, we have not done it uh, it is really nice to do yeah. it we will also follow but so what, which one is the best So generally, what we do is uh, see uh, if you look at uh, the suction jar, uh, suction jar. If you look at the mandatory protocol of the suction jar, you you have to keep at least hundred ml of hypochlorite solution at the bottom. Uh, that is the protocol in our hospital. I, I presume it's the same everywhere, right? Because we don't want the handlers, uh, the our healthcare workers who handle the suction jars to clean up at the end of surgery should be exposed to any of those things. So by the time they clean the jars, the, the whatever the fluid is there, biological fluid is already killed by the hypochlorite solution. So first hundred ml is hypochlorite solution, and subsequently we have a marker pen uh, uh, given to the daya or the housekeeping chap in the theater. So once they open up the uterus, they suck out the lyca. So once they suck out the lyca, the first mark they put is the hypochlorite solution. The second mark they put is the uh, amount of amniotic fluid that has come out. Uh, and suppose that the patient is having ascites, even that uh, acidic fluid and amniotic fluid also counted. And subsequently, about that is blood. And if the nurse is using any saline for dilution, mop, mopping the mouth, that also is kept into uh, count. And uh, so quantification is nothing but. you look at the exact or a, approximate uh, to the exact, exact amount of blood that patient is losing second important thing is uh, our mops have been standardized we have a 12 into 12 inch mop with a uh, uh, 12 layered gauze piece so if the mop is fully soaked we have we have done this exercise in our hospital we have uh, fully soaked dripping mop is about 60 to 70 ml of blood and partially 50% soakage is almost about 50% of that thing so uh, you need to standardize your mops in the hospital because most of the mops they come from one company only but uh, uh, they are all radio opaque uh, mop with the barium uh, 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 or a lead uh, lead uh, thread in the in between and uh, with the tail so importantly you soak this mop and do the standardization in your hospital so the number of mop count the partially soaked fully soaked and importantly the specimen loss and everything is quantified and assessed and uh, the the pad which is kept underneath the patient also 
uh, roughly if you look at the one square centimeter fully soaked pad is equal to 1 ml of blood so you you do you do this exact quantification and uh, you end up giving a proper so end of the day many a times when we give this massive transfusion next day when you check the hemoglobin it will be around 9 grams 8.8 grams it's okay but don't achieve 13 grams and 12 grams or hemoglobin uh, because again that is over uh, over uh, and neither achieve 6 grams of hemoglobin in the uh, first pod if you are giving enough transfusion despite the hemoglobin is 6 grams that means patient is still bleeding from the time of uh, end of surgery and you are still uh, the patient is bleeding inside so you need to put your ultrasound probe on the tummy and do e fast and look at uh, identify whether the patient the collection is there and always we put drains in this patient so that uh, it is easy to monitor but again i must tell you due respect and regards to my surgical colleagues or our surgical colleagues um, they are not used to putting drains uh, appropriately the drain placement has to be done in the retroperitoneal pouch uh, i mean uh, retro uh, behind the uterus uh, behind the uterus and one drain in the paracolic gutter on the left side or right side and it should be a tube drain 28 french or 26 french tube drain not the oromovac uh so that uh, you have a free drainage and uh, the monitoring becomes little easy many times they put the drain for the sake of putting it between it between it will be in between the omentum so nothing comes out so you have to see that you lift the bowels and put the drain in the paracolic gutter and one drain in the pouch of douglas so that uh, that those are the most dependent position uh, when the patient is in prod up position in the icu and the drain uh, fluid is collected and you can estimate the blood loss and appropriately transfusion happens wonderful sir uh, really good ideas and uh, nice suggestion sir uh, sir what is the end point of fluid resuscitation you should you have already told us not to give more so yeah. what could be the end where should we stop it sir yeah so once the patient loses 40% to 50% of blood volume you have started fluid so uh, generally end point should not be, should not exceed more than 3 liters yes, thumb rule in yes, the sir. when the patient loses 50% of blood volume Uh, uh you need to replace at least as i said don't aim at filling the intravascular compartment 100% you aim at filling uh, keep it the intravascular compartment filled by at least about uh, uh, 75 to 80% which we can see uh, i i know cvp is not a true guide uh, but yes if you have if you are used to ultrasound you can just look at the uh, ivc uh, from the mid axillary line uh, you can put a linear probe or i mean curvilinear probe and you can see the collapsibility index or distance will index if the patient is on uh, control ventilation but all these things are possible now because we are now uh, uh, tech savvy and uh, we need to embrace this newer modalities of volume assessment uh, intraoperatively also intraoperatively and if you are a cardiac anesthetist you can put a probe we have a te probe uh, available in our department we just put a probe, probe into the esophagus and do a te and you can assess the cardiac contractility and volume which is which is the most sensitive and most uh, easy way to do it but again not everybody is equipped with those things so at least Uh, a quantification of blood loss uh, is if you are doing it if the patient has more than 50% volume thumb rule do not give more than 3 to 4 liters maximum 4 liters and you need to start giving blood and blood components yes sir thank you sir uh, how do you have any experience on reconstituted whole blood sir what, what could be the role reconstituted whole blood see basically you... right sir okay. again a whole blood uh, is a uh, reconstituted whole blood that means you are uh, making together all the components again you basically you are giving different components no yes sir yeah so uh, you prefer to give all the components as separate entity state sir separate entity state away yes, yes because uh, reconstituting is again it involves uh, opening up the bags and uh, uh, being yes, the advantage uh, can we go for early fibrinogen transfusion absolutely. because fibrin absolutely because uh, uh, many a times we don't want to fibrinogen we just send pti and or an apdt i would always recommend that send fibrinogen early because if the fibrinogen is less than uh, sometimes fibrinogen goes undetectable in massive hemorrhage because we are given so much of crystalloids the fibrinogen is undetectable so let that stage not come because uh, uh, and cryos uh, if you have all the blood in hand like you have prbcs you have ffps you have cryos uh everything uh, I, what i do is or what we recommend is give coagulation factors simultaneously initially so that uh, before we give paxels if you are giving paxels before when the patient having coagulopathy uh whatever paxels you are transfusing patient is going to lose so first give coagulation factors uh and then uh, raise oxygen carrying capacity by giving intubation and ventilation 100% oxygen and with kfm mixture to knock down awareness and simultaneously give uh paxels uh, so that uh, you maintain everything but do not delay in giving 
coagulation factors uh, to the patient who is bleeding uh, profusely or who has lost 50% of blood volume. Yes, sir. One more so one question from me, sir. Uh, usually, this obstetric hemorrhage patients, uh, they will transit into disseminated intravascular coagulation at one point very, of time, sir. Very easily. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do we have any method to detect at that point which we are uh, going into DIC? And uh, in case the patient is in DIC, uh, would, uh, would uh, fibrinogen and tranexamic acid produce a counterproductive effect? See, the thing, when the patient is in, uh, I must tell you that the uh, counterproductive effect of hemorrhagin and uh, tranexamic acid uh, is uh, almost not seen in obstetric hemorrhage. Uh, we are fortunate. Okay. Uh, we are fortunate. But having said that, I always said that DVD prophylaxis also is important uh, post-operatively so that we can circumvent that uh, because if you are giving, uh, if the INR is 1.1 or uh, less than 1, that means there you there's a severe prothrombotic state that you have achieved. And that should okay. not happen. Uh, so see that these patients, uh, uh, you you ideally monitor uh, clinically, yes, uh, but more importantly by the blood loss which you are assessing because in a major optic hemorrhage, uh, patient loses almost 15 to 20 to 30 liters of blood. When I say uh, blood loss, 15 to 20 to 30 liters. The highest we have seen is 32 liters of blood loss. Uh, because the patient required uh, multiple uh, uh, entry and exit from the theater. Uh, but yes, when you have such magnitude of hemorrhage, you end up giving 200, 300 units of blood and blood compounds over a bit of two to three days. Uh, so monitoring is very essential. And I must tell you, I must tell you, obstetric hemorrhage, uh, you end up giving 60 to 80 units of blood. Uh, a major obstetric hemorrhage, especially we get bad referrals from outside. Uh, and that has to be done on a very, 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 very war footing basis. If you delay, you miss the bus. So if you allow the pH to drop to 7.1 and you don't come back to 7.3 or 7. Point, uh, at least 7.3 and above, you tend to go into the circle of death. So our aim is to bring the pH back. So at least do a blood gas. So blood gas, if the pH is less than 7.2 or 7, that means your acidosis is still there. DIC is still there. And myocardial depression also sets in. So you, you, it has the multi-pronged therapy that you need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, but uh, give blood adequately and compensate adequately and enough. But again, as I said, when I say enough, not too much. So that comes with experience. Uh, uh, that comes with experience. I still remember initial days we had hemoglobin of 11.8, 12.2 grams of the first POD, uh, which was undesirable. Uh, so you see that you give it in such a way that... Uh, uh, look at the field. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Edward was pointing out that most of the anesthetists now are in a social media savvy. Uh, and this thing has invaded into the theaters also. I'm sorry to say, but my colleagues also, they keep, they are sometimes glued onto the mobile while uh, anesthesia is on. Uh, so they don't, they are not vigilant on what is happening in the surgical field. And this is one entity, I think, where we should put an anonymous ban of allowing mobiles into the theater uh, so that they watch, they are more watchful on the surgical field and they, they themselves can assess and uh, quantify and uh, appropriately correct. If you are away from the field, even for a few minutes in major optic hemorrhage, we are missing the bus because sometimes we miss a bleeder or the surgeon misses a bleeder in their anxiety, which you have spotted and you can guide them. Yes, patient is still bleeding, BP is still low. I think there was a bleeder behind, uh, uh, below the bladder, in between the bladder. Or you, you can you can uh, be, you can guide the surgeon also. Uh, this has happened several times. So be vigilant. And vigilance uh, uh, and monitoring the continuous surgical field is also very, very important uh, uh, from the anesthesiologist viewpoint. And I'm sure if you are uh, vigilant and if you are uh, not hooked to your mobile, uh, you can assess without tag and other things and you can still achieve hemoglobin of 8 grams or 9 grams on the first POD, despite giving 80 to 90 years of blood transfusions. Thank you very much, sir. A very, very wonderful talk. I think uh, very important and this uh, this content will be carried to all the postgraduates contents uh, consultants across web and they this will definitely have an impact when they have face a case with obstetric hemorrhage thank you very much sir thank you thank you Dr. Sir, for being there sir most of us we are concentrating the resuscitation towards uh, hemocoagulation mep and saturation they forget about the resuscitation about the hemoglobin, cellular hypoxia, acidosis. Yes. So you are right to find out that point, sir. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you very much. You, sir. Thank you, sir. So, sir, sir. So, yes, sir. Uh, next on agenda, we have our uh, uh, esteemed faculty to share a few words with you on, on how we took over this uh, one, one year of teaching.
so i invite uh, gomuthi ma'am to first uh, uh, talk few words on on this happening sir on this one year gomuthi ma'am recording in progress Gomuthi ma'am can you share a few yeah. words with us ma'am yeah yeah uh, so uh, and uh, it was a beautiful topic i just got lost in your topic very beautiful uh, topic sir thank you for that and uh, thank you edward sir it's been uh, i think this uh, this this one year has been very incredible uh, being here and uh, being with my teacher professor edward sir was my teacher when i was a post graduate and being with everybody else it was it was an awesome experience uh, what else is there to say thank you sir thank you and uh, thank you shiva thank you thank you ma'am uh, next i invite uh, dr sarva vinodini to share few words good day all of you uh, thank you sunil sir for that mind blowing lecture uh, and uh, this one year this one year was actually so fabulous uh, i extend my thanks to all the viewers and all the all the speakers uh, who came and spoke in our platform and uh, without without all of you this would not have been possible thank you edward sir for uh, creating such a wonderful team so happy to be a part of this team actually we six were like six phases of a cube or six phases of a dice we just kept rolling over this one year compensating each other uh, contributing to each other and supporting each other so that's how it, we were able to pull along this one whole year so i'm so glad to be a part of this team and the one thing that united all six of us was the passion towards anesthesia and the passion towards teaching and learning uh, in organizing this we have learned a lot a lot not just uh, in anesthesia per se also non non academically we 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 have, we have uh, created such a good bond and we have learned so much so thank you for all the all the good wishes that you all have shared to share with us uh, thank you so much it is a great great opportunity to be a part of this uh, esteemed team thank you so much well said sarva you have reflected all our teammates uh, feelings uh, thank you sarva uh, next i invite uh, dr guru sandhya to share a few words thank you shiva sir indeed it's uh, a great pleasure in uh, being one of the organizing member of the online anesthesia which we have completed some hundred hours of teaching and uh, thank you all the viewers and all the speakers who kept us supporting uh, like there was no monetary benefits which were involved but then to the passion of anesthesia we were all uh, connected with the passion of anesthesia and to teach the post graduates and uh, the uh, uh, group has been overwhelming with messages which um, thanks uh, the organizer of the edward johnson sir and uh, all the best uh, to the uh, upcoming year where uh, he has posted uh, it uh, consultant forum where this session will happen once in a month and thank you for the opportunity thank you sir shiva sir thank you thank you guru uh, I, i think rajesh sir and uh, shantri are a uh, little bit uh, difficult to reach uh, their with their family uh, and uh, as all, all our team has said uh, i would like to extend my uh, uh, whole hearted thanks to all the participants first it is for you who people who we have been uh, doing all this uh, so the overwhelming participation which really kept us going i would like to also thank uh, all the faculty guest speakers because uh, uh, more all of them when we are uh, when we chose them and we called them they uh, they gave their consent uh, prepared very good slides uh, a good enriched content so that it reached all the uh, students and uh, they did a very really wonderful time consuming job in spite of their heavy schedules all of them came they taught us very well Uh, it was very useful and i would also like to uh, extend my thanks to our sponsors acurella and uh, aon logistics they uh, they did a very good supportive work all this one year uh, and thank you edward sir for forming this group uh, because it is in your uh, platform which we all have shown a very good stage show uh, i was uh, really pleased to be a part of this team and uh, rajesh sir shantini they uh, they not here but they have contributed a lot uh, Gurusanthi, all these people were very resourceful because they have a wide uh, contact uh, of all the consultants in this uh, uh, in, in Indian India and abroad. 
thank you very much i especially thank edward sir for uh, being the platform for all of us uh, all six of us to uh, grow and show who we are in this online platform thank you very much sir and uh, now i ask edward sir to, to give a concluding remarks thank edward, you sir. Sir, sir thank you all my team colleagues and we ended with a high note with a high profile presentation by sunil pandey sir it's a right presentation in the right time thank you sunil sir thank you always a pleasure thank you thank you all the faculties we have shown a great uh, affection towards our program so you have presented throughout this program and uh, you have given your good feedback about this program i thank all the faculties and also the sponsor akrula and host a1 logics and most importantly the viewers even uh, today even though it is a, a christmas day there are more than 200 viewers are in the online youtube channels so i thank them also and we will meet next year with another different type of uh, presentations concern concentrating on the anesthesia update for the consultant thank you one and all we will meet next year thank you and a happy new year happy thank new year to everybody thank you so much thank you happy new year everybody thank happy you. new year thank you sir happy new year happy year sir thank you so much thank you sunil sir thank you azam for being there with us thank you sir always a pleasure thank you sir bye Recording stopped.